Praise God. Well, you ready for some Bible? All right. I want you to open up your Bibles with me, please, to the book of Judges. You got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, then Judges, then Ruth, and 1 Samuel. We'll be going to, uh, if you find Joshua, Judges is right beside it. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word, chapter 14 and verse 5. Judges 14, chapter 14 and verse 5. Going to read down to verse 9. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath and behold a young lion roared against him and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and he rent him as he would have rent a kid that is a, a small goat and he had nothing in his hand but he told not his father and his mother what he had done. And he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. And after a time, he returned to take her, that is, down into the Philistine camp. And he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and his mother and gave them and they did eat. But he told them not that, that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. I want to draw your attention to first phrase in verse 9. And, and Samson took thereof in his hands the honey and went on eating. I want to use for a subject this morning, hands full of honey. You may be seated. Hands full of honey. Now, we know that Samson had a lot of failures in his life. We know that Samson was a judge, and he was a deliverer to bring deliverance from the Philistines, or Israel from the Philistines. Philistines had had Israel under captivity. We know that Samson was raised up to be a deliverer. He was a strong man. I don't think he appeared strong, but when the Spirit of God came on him, he was a strong man. I don't believe Samson looked like World Atlas guy. I don't believe he was muscled up and his chest bulging out. I believe it's a puny little thing like Joshua over here. <laughs> but when the Spirit of the Lord came on Joshua, I mean Samson, there was great strength. By the way, when the Spirit of the Lord comes on Joshua, there's strength too. And uh, yeah, go ahead, give Joshua a big hand. That's good, amen. Now, I could talk about the failures of Samson. I could spend a long time, well, not a long time because you wouldn't bear with me that long, but I, I could spend the time, an enduring time, talking about the failures of Samson. But I'm not going to talk about the failures of Samson this morning because we know that he's found in Hebrews chapter 11 as a hero of faith. He's listed as a great deliverer, a great achiever. We do know that he was a nightmare when it came to the Philistines because he was an incredible, delivering, powerful man of God when the Spirit of God came on him. Now, Samson did like the ladies. And he got his eye on one down in the Philistine camp. Now, it was wrong for Samson to get his eyes on the little girl down in Timnath. But the Bible says that God had planned that little rendezvous because he wanted to bring a conflict between the Philistines and Israel. You can find that in this 14th chapter. And so Samson begins to tell mom and dad, I want her, I want her. She's gorgeous, I want her. I want her to be my wife. And 
Mom and Dad said to Samson, couldn't you pick one out among our people? No, I want the Philistine girl down in Timnath. And so Mom and Dad goes with Samson down to Timnath. And I don't know where Mom and Dad was during this journey, but the Bible says he didn't let Mom and Dad know about it. A young lion attacked Samson. And that young lion came out and roared against Samson. We're going to talk about the lion's roar in a little bit. And the Spirit of God came on Samson. And he grabbed that lion, that young lion. I think it was a full-grown, but young lion. And Samson maybe grabbed him, you know, one hand in the upper jaw and one hand in the lower jaw and just ripped him in two. Throwed him over to the side. We know that he killed him pretty quickly because the Bible says he rented toward him like a little kid. So obviously he grabbed him where he could grab him and he just split him in two. Just wouldn't want to get a fight with that guy. Wouldn't even want to get in an argument with that guy. And the lion attacked Samson and Samson, the Spirit of God, came on him and he, he, he killed the lion. Just cast it over in the side that went on down into Timnath. There was, a, there was a ceremony, there was something going on, there was a great, uh, an engagement. It didn't work out, there was a big dispute and there was a big battle. We're not getting into that right now. I want to look at the lion. I want us to look at the honey that was developed inside of the carcass of that lion. The Bible says that when Samson made his way back, that he stopped to look at the carcass. And when he stopped to look at the carcass, now that tells me that Samson wasn't very old either because only young people stop and look at dead animals. Right? Old people don't do that. They hold their nose and run. Young people go up there and look at it. Ooh, isn't that cool? Right? Yeah. That's wonderful. No, it's disgusting. But the Bible says that Samson, after the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, in verse 5 and verse 6 of chapter 14 of Judges, that he rent that lion and killed it, obviously, because the Spirit of God was upon him. In Judges chapter 13, verse 25, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord began to move Samson at times from the camp of Dan between Zorah and Estol. Meaning that God was using Samson as an instrument to fight against the enemy of Israel, the Philistines. When he took this lion, and once again I'm not talking about the failures of Samson, but this is an incredible success. He tore that lion in two because the Spirit of God moved upon him. Let me tell you, friends, when the Spirit of God moves upon whatever, there's going to be life and there's going to be power. Whenever the Spirit of God moves, and let me say this, no one gets saved without the Spirit of God moving. No great church service will happen without the Spirit of God moving. We didn't get here without the Spirit of God moving. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 down to 3, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. But the Bible says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, the deep. And as the Spirit of God moved upon earth, the Bible says that God said, let there be light. And that was the beginning of creation. You see salvation just in that verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1. The earth was without form. Void. Isn't that a description of a lost sinner? A person that's lost without God is without form and void and darkness is upon the deeps of their heart. And the Spirit of God moves upon a lost person, convicts them of their sin. That lost person comes to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and God says, let there be light. And Jesus stands up in the middle of St. John and says, I am the light of the world. And so salvation comes through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I was looking through some of the 
Josh says, when I do this, I'm typing on Facebook. Josh says, that's not how it works. He says, you do this. Yeah, that's how I do it. But anyway, I've seen it on Facebook where the scientists have proved now that when a, when a child is conceived, when the sperm hits the egg of the mother and the sperm hits the egg, and the child is conceived, scientists have said now there's a flash of light. I mean, God's in the light business. God's in the life business. And I'm thankful for the fact that God hasn't given up on me and He hasn't given up on you. He cares about us, He loves us, and He watches over us. But nothing permanent, nothing incredible, nothing sovereign, nothing wonderful, nothing of life and, and uh, substance that endures will happen without the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God must be there. Amen? And the Bible says that Samson, when he came back, he looked at the carcass, and he saw that there was, that honeybees had, had built a, a hive in the, in the carcass of the lion. In fact, the Bible says that he took and rent that kid, kid like a, rent that lion like a kid, and there's something interesting about this young lion. If you, uh, uh, it's not always so, but most of the time, a lion's like any other. A lion's a kitty cat. A cat's a cat. The only thing that's not a cat is a catfish. A cat's a cat. They purr, they play, they mouse. A cat's a cat. Now, a lion might mouse with a kangaroo, but they mouse. Right? A cat's a cat. And usually a cat, when it's going to get its prey, it's quiet. Quiet. And when it gets to its prey, it jumps on it. And it bites it. And it kills it. Well, the story, this young lion must have thought, I can take care of this skinny runt pretty easy because he roared before he went after him. The Bible says this lion roared against Samson as to say, I'm going to get you. Roar. I, I know that scared you plumb to death. Your hair is turning gray now. But I, I did muffle it down just a little bit because I didn't want to blow you plumb out of your seat. And I didn't want you running to the back of the church. Have you ever heard a lion roar? I mean, really roar. If I was out in the woods at one o'clock in the morning and I heard one of them roar, I would not be in the woods five minutes later or even five seconds later. But the Bible says that this young lion must have thought, I can take care of this little punk all by myself. So he roared. That's, Samson wasn't a big guy. And so he roared against Samson. And Samson just ripped him in two. Because the Spirit of God came on him. A type and a picture of Lucifer, of the devil. He is as a roaring lion. And Lucifer begins, and this lion, as a young lion, when Lucifer was young, and I, and I speak as a man. I realize there's no age there. But when Lucifer was early young with us, uh, he, he had a big roar. And he terrified people. He roared and he roared and he roared and he roared. And he came to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus Christ came, our Samson. And Jesus ripped the devil apart. And took care of the powers of that roaring lion. Let me read a scripture to you that's wonderful. You say, what's this got to do with hands full of honey? I'll get to it in a little bit. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 through 9. Peter says, casting all your care upon Jesus, for he careth for you. Be sober. 
That word sober means don't be drunk. That word sober means don't be stupid. Be sober. Be vigilant. That means don't be asleep. Be alert. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And you may be saying, preacher, didn't you just say that our Samson, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, ripped the devil apart? Well, let me say this right now. Just as Samson ripped that lion apart, and that lion was cast aside there to decay, about the only thing left of the devil now after Jesus got a hold of him is his decaying future. Woo! Missed a place to shout. His decaying future. The Bible says that we're to be alert, watchful. Why? Because our adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion. Now I'm told, and I don't know a lot of lion theology or lionology here, but I'm told that the lion usually doesn't roar till after it kills its prey. It's quietly, it comes upon it and it kills its prey. The only time it does roar is if it's got other enemies around, other lions around. And the roar is to confuse its prey so that its prey don't know where to run or where to go. And that's why Peter said, casting all your care upon Jesus, we know where to run. Now the young lion has sharp teeth and the young lion can kill. But now that Jesus Christ, like Samson, has ripped the lion, the old devil, apart, the devil now has aged a bit, at least in our rim with him, he's aged. Now the Bible does say in Revelation he's a great red dragon. That's with over Israel. But I want you to listen to the Christian. The devil cannot sneak up on us unless we just, you know, act like a bunch of doofuses. Paul said we're not to be ignorant of his devices. And so we're to be really sharp and on our toes and ready. Now, an old lion, what he'll do is he'll put other lions that are young, and the old lion, he doesn't chase the prey. He's old. And he doesn't really eat the prey at first because his teeth are bad. I just described the devil. And the old lion... He's still got his roar. And what he'll do is he'll put the cub or the, what do they call them, prides, put them out there, and they will weigh late for the prey, and the old lion will roar. When he roars, the victim will run into the trap of the others. I want you to know that the devil, all he's got left is the roar. He has traps set for us. He has he has devastations for us. He has things that we will run into, but all he has left in his arsenal is scare tactics. That's all he's got left. Because Jesus has already defeated him. Are you listening to me? You say, does the devil have power? He has power over unbelievers and sinners, but he don't have no power over me unless I slip up and I'm not prepared for him. The Bible says that the devil is like a roaring lion, Peter said, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. That word may is a permission word. May I have a drink? May I have the last piece of fried chicken? May I have your attention? May I use your car? May I have... A drink, may I, whatever, you know, may I, that's a permission word. And the Bible says the devil comes seeking who he may devour. And so I say to the devil, no, you may not. Hello? 
I say to the devil when he wants to do something in my life, I say, no, you may not. Amen? Come on. You may not destroy my life. Devil, you may not interfere with my children. Devil, you may not interfere with our church. Devil, you may not interfere with my life. And devil, you will not pray with my mind and meditate and cause me to think things I shouldn't think because Samson found the honey where the defeated line was. And I want to say to you, I have found honey. I have found honey in the defeat of the devil. I have found honey in the empty carcass of Satan. I have found the victorious power of Jesus Christ in my life. And the Bible says that when, when Samson went and found this carcass, when he looked, he found a swarm of honeybees. And them honeybees had made a hive in there and they had made honey. Now, Judy and I, we have honey. Uh, we have a uh, beehive. In fact, we have a honey beehive right here at the church, not too far from where I'm standing. There's a beehive back. They're real cold right now. They're gentle. In fact, they're in bed. But uh, we love, I love messing with honeybees. Well, after my wreck, I got stoved up, so Judy does most of the putting on the garment. She is really cute when she puts on that beehive and that mask. And yeah. But, but I, lo I love to mess with honeybees. I do. There's nothing more relaxation. There's nothing more relaxing than to pop the lid off of two or three hives and stand there in the midst of about 400,000 honeybees swarming your head saying, bee, out of, out of here. It is so relaxing. No one bothers me. Nobody walks up to me and says, can I borrow $20? Nobody bothers me. I've got, it's me and Jesus and the bees have it all worked out. Now, I like doing that. And, but what the fun part is getting the honey. And what you have to understand is the honey is very sticky substance. Very sweet, but it's very sticky. And I want to say right now that when Samson came and found that honey in the defeated lion, the lion that had been killed, the Bible says in verse 8, after a time he returned to take her, and that's the lady at Timnath, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, there was a swarm of bees and the honey in the carcass of the lion. But notice what it says in verse 9. Samson took the honey. Let me just put it like this. The Spirit of God came upon Samson. He overcame. He conquered. He won battles. The Spirit of God on Samson moved, and there was great victories. Samson had a conflict with the lion. Samson destroyed and defeated that lion. After he defeated that lion, he came back and he found honey inside the carcass of that lion. Verse 9 of Judges 14, Samson took the honey to others. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and his mother and gave them and they did eat, but he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. Now let me say this. Jesus makes the power of the devil no more than a dying carcass. Hello. And I want to say this right now. What Jesus Christ did for you and I. He destroyed the works of the devil and the devil is no more than a dying, his future's dying. He's a dying carcass. But in the defeat of Satan is the sweetness of God. In the destruction of Satan's power over us is the honeycomb and the sweetness of God. And so Samson reached in and the Bible says he didn't just reach in with his hands and eat it there and then wash up and leave. The Bible says he went on his way eating. Well, if he went on his way eating, that honey got all over his clothes. That honey got all over his face. I mean, he was more souped up and honeyed up than a two-year-old. I mean, he was, it was all over him. Honey on his shoes, honey on his, uh, on his shirt, 
He probably didn't have on his shirt, but honey on his chest, honey on his chin, honey everywhere. And he's eating away and he gets to his, he's taking honey with him for the journey. He's taking the sweetness of that honey with him and the journey. And I want you to know I'm taking the sweetness that what Jesus Christ did for me on Golgotha's hill. I'm taking the sweetness of, the, of what Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross of Calvary and defeated Satan in my life. I'm taking the sweetness of, of Satan's future being blotted out for eternity in the lake of fire. I'm taking the sweetness of God's honey in my life and I'm eating it on my journey and I'm, I, I'm filled with the sweetness of, of God's blessing on my journey. And when I meet others along the way, I offer them some. Now the reason he didn't tell his mom and dad that he got the honey out of the dead carcass for two reasons. Number one, it's gross. Number two, it was a law against Leviticus that you couldn't touch a dead thing. But let me say this right now. It's different when it comes to Jesus Christ. The Bible says when you touch a dead thing, you're unclean. It's different when you come to Jesus Christ. We were unclean anyway. And my uncleanness drove me to Jesus Christ. And God began to make honey in my old dead life. And God began to give sweetness in my life. And now I want to offer that sweetness to other people. Amen. Because Jesus Christ has given me eternal life and the forgiveness of sin and so I offer the sweetness to other people. Amen. And so I, I spend my life trying to tell people God is good. God is powerful. God is forgiving. God is sovereign. God is a good God. God is a God that will give you life and joy unspeakable. I want to spend my life not telling people that God is bad. I don't want to spend my life telling people that God is mean and God is uh, uh, wrathful. I want to spend my life telling people that God is so good that God took our hell, took our judgment. God is so good that he wants to give us the honey to go to heaven in. Amen. And one thing I want to one thing I want to say for sure about honey. Honey will if you the Bible just says Samson got it out hands full, hands full of honey. And one thing you got to understand when you get honey out with your hand, you got sticky fingers. And I've got sticky fingers, but they're not to steal something. We used to say people when we were growing up, my mom and dad would say when someone came to the house, and they were, they were usually relatives, mom and dad would say, watch them, they got sticky fingers. Well, that wasn't a compliment. It meant that they would find something at your house and they would take it. That sticky fingers. Well, I've got sticky fingers, but in a godly sense. I've got sticky fingers for God's word. I've got sticky fingers to go to the house of God. I've got sticky fingers to tell people about Jesus Christ. I've got a, a hankering and a desire in my soul to take the sweetness of God and give it to others. Amen. Hello. And I want it all over me. I want God all over me. I want God all over me. That honey was probably in Samson's hair and he had a heap of hair. That honey was all over his eyebrows probably and all over his beard. That honey was all over his clothing, what clothing he had as far as his back and, and whatever. Uh, he, that honey was all over his shoes, all over him, all over. It was sticky, and Samson was one sticky mess. And I want to say to friends, when it comes to loving God, I'm one sticky blessing. Amen. I'm not a mess, I'm a blessing. Amen. Why is it that I go to Walmart? I don't go very often because uh, I don't like the hypocrites there. But anyway, I don't go to Walmart very often. But when I do go to Walmart, there's a reason why people switch aisles on me. They see me and they switch aisles. Where'd they go? Now, none of the people in this room, if you were in this room... I wouldn't even share this illustration, but you're not here, so thank God. Watch me on television, get mad, 
watching television don't get mad at me here. But I go to Walmart and see people, and they on purpose avoid me. Why? Because I'm sticky. Amen? I'm sticky. People get around me, and, and it rubs off. And they're, they're going to say, man, I, I, I am a sticky mess. And I hope you are a sticky blessing today. I hope you're just sticky up good. Amen? And when you walk out of here, I want you to be so full of Jesus Christ that sinners will want to look at you and say, man, I want what you got. I want you to be so blessed with the Spirit of God and so anointed with the Spirit of God that your dog will want to lick your face when you get home. Well, he will anyway, but well, maybe my dog would want to lick your face. Or maybe some other dog would want to lick your face. Amen? Now, Someone said they can break a dog of licking you if you have a certain way. Well, I've got a dog. My wife has a dog. My daughter has a dog. That you can't get within five feet of that dog. She's going to lick you. Her tongue's going like this. Constantly. And you can't stop her. So I've learned. You know, I, I'm a little bit irritated. Is it all right if I complain just for a moment? Is it all right? I'm going to anyway, so I don't really... Let me complain for a little moment. Little baby, and when we talk about baby, I call Judy baby and I call the dog baby. We got two babies. Judy is the smart and intelligent, beautiful uh, lady, the lady of the house, but the, we call the other dog baby. And, and when I holler at baby, Judy don't know whether I'm hollering to her or hollering to the dog. But, but baby does like to lick all the time. And, and uh, I get in, when I was hurt so bad in the car wreck, uh, I was in recliner, and that dog would get right up and lay on that, that leg that was hurt to warm it. That dog sensed that I needed some healing. That dog lay, and that, that dog became my dog because I had that wreck. So I've been injured with a dog on top of the injury. <laughs> Don't mean to understand me. It's a nice dog, but the dog likes to lick. Here's the problem with that dog. Now I'm going to complain. I had this awesome recliner. And the recliner is plugged into the wall, and it's so awesome the motor is running all the time. Someone says, what is that noise? And it's that hum of my recliner just waiting, saying, James, sit down. <laughs> I just hear the hum, sit down, relax. Well, you know, I, I don't want dog hair all over me. And if I get in that recliner, dog hair is all over me because that dog has took over my chair. <laughs> and now I've noticed that I'm sitting in a hard chair, a kitchen chair, to watch television while the little dog that long <laughs> is sitting in my chair that big. <laughs> and all it took was some hair. Something ain't right. How many agree that that ain't right? Everybody say that ain't right. It ain't right. But I don't know how to fix it. I do not know how to fix it. And so, you know, I'll just continue to sit in an award chair. But I want to say to everybody in this room, are you sticky enough for God that people are attached to you? Are you sweet enough? Have you been joined the sweetness of God? Is that honey oozing out of your life? Is that honey of God dripping from your fingers? Is that honey of God all over you? Amen. When you walk out of this church, you ought to have God on your face. Amen. God on your face. And so I want to say to everybody in this room, please listen to me, please, please, please. There's honey where Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. And the roaring lion has set traps for you. And all the devil can do, all he can do, 
is try to scare you into doing things you shouldn't do or try to entice you into things you shouldn't be enticed in. But the, only, the only power the devil has, and I'm speaking this to a Christian now, the only power the devil has to a Christian now is to set traps for you and to roar, to scare you, to run or to think or to go in the wrong place. But Peter said, Casting all your care upon Him, Jesus, for He cares for you. So let's get, how about, let's get hands full of honey. I said, let's get hands full of honey. Let's take some to our neighbor. Let's get hands full of honey and let's take some to our friends and our relatives. Let's take hands full of honey and let's share it with people. You don't have to tell them uh, right off that it comes from, from uh, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just get them hungry for the things of God. Attract them to it. And then tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's important that our words have power. And our words won't have power until we live pure before people. Amen. Stand with me. We're going to give an invitation. I hope you enjoyed the message. Everybody say, devil, you may not. Come on, say it again. Devil, you may not. That's the kind of life we need to live. Devil, you may not. Because Jesus, our Samson, our deliverer, tore the powers of Satan apart, cast it to the side, and through the defeat, of the devil, to the defeat of the roaring lion, Lucifer, the devil. We can draw honey. We can enjoy the sweetness of God. Because all the devil has left is a decaying, decomposing future. And you and I have an everlasting future as children of God. Altars open, you come.